Welcome to the Free Dive Cafe, episode 136 with Alex Ginas. My name is Donnie, I am the host of the Free Dive Cafe. The Free Dive Cafe is the long form interview podcast that explores the backstories, the training, the challenges, and the combined wisdom and personal philosophies of the world's free divers. The Free Dive Cafe website and home base is at www.freedivecafe.com. And of course, you can find all the episodes on all the good podcast players like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Stitcher. Welcome to another Free Dive Cafe video interview uh, version. I hope you enjoy this new format. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel, please, if you want to keep up to date with all the videos that I'm bringing out here. It's not just podcasts, I'm also doing educational things and entertainment uh, for free divers. Uh, Patreon supporters can also view the video clips of the Desert Island Questions section through their Patreon dashboards at patreon.com slash freedivecafe. And a million thank yous to all of you who support my projects by signing up there. On today's show is Alex Ginas. Alex, originally from Colombia, has been on a recent tear, making huge progress in his diving, especially since we recorded this interview a few weeks ago. He just dived his first 100 meters in the Ida World Championship in Roatan a few weeks after this interview was recorded. Amazed to see my friend achieving these days depths and what an exciting prospect for the future okay without further ado let's go and get alex let's dive alex welcome to the free dive cafe um thank you donnie thank you very much glad to be here man let's uh tell us a little bit about like where you're from like um your origins um and how you came to discover the underwater world like how early did you get involved with it <clears throat> so I was born in Colombia in South America. My dad was a waterman of sorts before that term ever existed. Um, I grew up right across the street from the ocean and since I was a, a newborn, he took me in the water. So I was always comfortable in that medium. Um, the weekends were spent uh, windsurfing in the beach or going camping in the Caribbean uh, coast of Colombia and going snorkeling with him. And that's kind of my first introduction to the underwater world. I would just, I don't know what free diving was, and I don't know if there was uh, any recognized agencies at that point. I'm a lot older than I look. <laughs> <laughs> he is. <laughs> but, Even uh, older than me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, at that point, I would just try to follow my dad when he'd go down, and, you know, I was, I was comfortable in the water. Um, from there, we moved on to San Andres, and some of the free divers will be familiar with that island. Uh, Walid has done competitions there. So San Andres is an island that is part of Colombian territory? Yeah, you could almost call it like the Hawaii of Colombia. Yeah. It's about, I might get this wrong, maybe 600 or 800 kilometers from the northern coast of Colombia, and it's only... 100 kilometers or 150 from the coast of Nicaragua. Okay, so that's pretty far away from Colombia and closer to Nicaragua. Yeah. I remember it's a long time since I interviewed Walid for the first time, but now it's coming back to me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it's tiny. It's like uh, it's this paradise that's, uh, I don't think, I think if you run around it, it's not even a half marathon. Okay. So it's puny and there's nothing around it. And uh, there, like the ocean life is all I knew, you know, started windsurfing quite a bit then always in the water playing around very unsupervised you were actually living there yeah i was yeah. living there i lived there from ages eight till 13. so then like snorkeling and spear fishing was a part of my life but in a different way completely recreational kind of how you see when you go to tropical destinations see the little kids playing around they don't know what they're mm -hmm. doing with the plastic fence that was me unfortunately life took me from the coast to the landlocked in medellin which is uh, one of the bigger cities in colombia where all the narcos and all the good stuff happened uh, back in the day. Now I'm hearing the, the G sound again. The Medi you say Medellin. Medellin, yeah, that's Everyone great. says Med Medellin or Medellin, right? Okay, so yeah, yeah. so yeah, we're a famous uh, Medellin. Yes. Famous for the nefarious. Yeah, for Pablo, Pablito. Yes. <laughs> so what was it like there? Um, it was a hard transition for me because it was my first time. I would spend like one or two months uh, visiting my grandma and family um, most every year of my life up until that point. But then, like, the ocean life was completely taken away from me. Um, and then it was hard, like, moving to uh, that far. And then the 
you know, just not having the options to windsurf anymore, like new friends, completely different lifestyle. But, you know, I started racing BMX, so it kind of just took up to took up a whole nother sport to sort of get the juices going. And, and uh, that's kind of when my addiction to cycling became, uh, came up or came about. Um, Put from, your hands on the table. Oh yeah. From Medellin, we moved to... Um, to Charlotte, North Carolina, or near Charlotte, North Carolina, and that's where my U.S. life started. I was age 16, and then fast forward, I don't know how many years, I think I was 30-something when I first saw people spearfishing off the coast of North Carolina with uh, catching, like, wahoo and dolphin, uh, mahi-mahi, not the not the flipper kind of dolphin. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, <Phew. laughs> So I was super interested and saw the pictures and coincidentally one of those guys was really good friends with friends of mine and my girlfriend. So it introduced me to him and I just started getting super interested through spear fishing and shortly after that I became obsessed with it and went to Florida to take uh, one of Martin Stepanek's first courses with FII. And then from there on it just kind of took off, had a whole nother story of, or path to get to this point. Yeah, so and you said that you sort of like you were in your 30s already when and people who are watching won't believe that <laughs> but <clears throat> um there's a that whole gap there when you were in the states and then up until that point that 15 year period or whatever like what were you doing for a profession or did you have so, a profession or? yeah i graduated from high school and then um had so, had some issues <laughs> at that point ended up uh having to go to community college because of actually immigration issues and then um, once I got my immigration sorted out, uh, I ended up going to North Carolina State University to get an engineering degree. Um, when I graduated, it was in the downturn of the economy, 2003 and four, so jobs were kind of scarce. And uh, the one that I found or that I got was in Los Angeles. So I moved to L.A. Uh, for two, three years. And I just missed home quite a bit. Ended up moving back to Wilmington. Wilmington is a really really nice place mm -hmm. to have a coastal lifestyle mm -hmm. um a few free divers are from that area mm -hmm. that so you, you probably you, know is that where you met ashley and ren and yes yeah. i mean i was living my dad was living in wilmington while i was going to college but mm -hmm. i didn't really move back to wilmington and make it my home as it's what the town that i would call home now until after uh los angeles and yeah that's where i met the whole community with uh ryan mckinnis uh used to do uh nc tv i don't know if you no. any of you guys remember that no and uh maybe some yeah. of those guys remember it but not me no. and uh yeah i met ren and ash and they have a quite a good uh spear fishing community and as you know sometimes that evolves into free diving mm -hmm. sometimes it evolves into yeah. free diving i like that um <clears throat> right tell us about this uh slightly complicated um immigration <laughs> issue and what happened there so i was uh 19 years old when i graduated from high school um and we decided to take a road trip up the coast of uh, of the U.S. all the way north. And we were at the Canadian border. And um, my friend was like, let's go to Canada. The drinking age is 19. I was like, well, I'm 19. Sounds good. So uh, I was I, at that point, I had only a, a overstate tourist visa. But I called the border and I was like, hey, uh, you know, what does it take to get into Canada or back from Canada? And they were like, oh, just your driver's license. I was like, are you sure? It's like, yeah, well, I got one of those. So let's go. So I went to Canada, um, drank a beer, chugged a two liter bottle of uh, cider, got a tummy ache, walked back drunk. And then uh, at the border, they started questioning me. And then they found out that I was not a U.S. citizen and that I had overstayed my visa which uh, ended up with me going to immigration jail for about a month, um, oh, no. getting paroled and having to uh, apply for political asylum, which was a process that took about two and a half years of so going back and forth to New Jersey and New York for court proceedings. Finally, it was granted, and at that point, it's when I switched from community college to university. Right. Yeah, so that, that, that <coughs> thing happened earlier than I thought. I thought it happened later on, but... Um, no. Yeah. But so you're lucky in a sense because things could have gone. Yeah, the other option was uh, deportation. Yeah, and they would have deported you to Colombia. Yeah. Oh. So and that was uh, the only bad thing is that during that time um, that I had political asylum, 
is my travels were extremely restricted. Um, you, I couldn't use my Colombian passport, and I did not have a U.S. passport. So I had to apply for the special document that uh, it's only valid basically for a year, and it takes six months to get it, and it's expensive to get it, and sometimes you have to hire attorneys to do the, the process or file the paperwork for it. So uh, traveling for free diving was not possible, <clears throat> and I was sort of stuck in that status until 2016. Yeah, and but finally everything came right, and now yeah. you're officially a U.S. citizen. Yes, very, very glad I'm a U.S. citizen. Thank yeah. you very much. <clears throat> so, on the one hand, I want to hear about how you got involved in the competition freediving scene or the deep freediving scene. Maybe not the, like, how you started getting involved with the competitions and things like that. But um, if you can also integrate into that, like the health issues that you experienced yeah. as well, because I think that is. Um, an inspiring part about like meeting you now and training with you and seeing you dive and seeing how dedicated you are and how much you want to put into this sport but it's important for the listeners and viewers to understand that you're also coming from a very challenging place so if you can kind of yeah so I'll start with the free diving um, kind of how I got introduced to death we'll call it that in 2013 actually Ren Chapman was uh, the chief of safety for um, for Vertical Blue, and uh, that was my first introduction to death. Uh, there I met a lot of free divers that inspire me quite a bit. Um, it was, for me, I was, at that point I had a mechanical engineering job, so it was very challenging to get time off, and I spent my whole vacation basically working the competition, which was a big deal because it was a month of vacation in engineering. You don't do that when you're, uh, you know, beginning your career, and I was just inspired by the lifestyle of these people, and always thought that I had a good chance if uh, if I dedicated myself to to free diving and wanted to find out where my limits were or what I could do but life kind of had a bunch of false starts for my free diving career um, you know first my actual career mechanical engineering made it, made it impossible to dedicate enough time to train and in North Carolina you don't have access to depth so it was difficult to do it from that end Were you doing like office job kind of stuff at this point yeah I was in consulting so basically when you build a commercial or industrial you have a set of plans and in those plans there's uh, mechanical engineering plans which include the HVAC and the plumbing and that was my job was to produce okay. those plans but um, where was that so from that point on, um, in 2016, I finally had enough, both of uh, my job. So I quit my engineering job. And, and during that time, you know, having seen all these free divers that somehow made it work and were able to take off months at a time in the year and teach or they figured out one way or another, I started investing a little bit in some properties and just had a little bit of passive income so that when I quit, I wasn't just going to be completely destitute. And uh, that helped me kind of transition from a engineering job to freelance instructor to sometimes working in movies to sometimes mm -hmm. working at the bike shop to you know ocean rescue whatever it took to you know to make ends meet and give me the opportunity to travel and and do this but um during that time in i think 2018 i started uh free diving again like uh getting more inter interested in death i uh, went and safety to uh, competition in colombia uh, what was the name of it? Uh, Cup, uh, Delphinus Cup uh, with Carlos Correa. You went to Vertical Blue in 2013 already. 2013, yeah. yeah. So I went in 2013, and then after 2016, I had the opportunity to go, you know, like actually had the opportunity to travel because mm -hmm. I had my, uh, I was able to use my Colombian passport, not even my U.S. passport. And it was 2018 was when I found out that I had, um, lymphoma or sort of when the symptoms of lymphoma started it was Christmas 2018 I noticed uh, lymph nodes in my inguinal area or around my groin were swollen and you know that could be a, a million of things it could be you're just sick fighting an infection mm -hmm. fighting a virus uh, many things so it wasn't time to panic yet so I spent the next you know a couple of weeks just waiting for the swelling to go down it didn't so then I was living in Puerto Rico at the point at that time I started getting the test done for for the cancer stuff and I was officially diagnosed with lymphoma that April but I had already committed to safety um, uh, Delphinus Cup in Santa Marta with Carlos Correa that's how it was can you just uh, for the listeners who maybe are unsure about 
what lymphoma is, if you could just like give a very brief um, explanation. So lymphoma, there's a lot of types. Like saying cancer is like saying infection, and lymphoma is a type of cancer, and even then it's subdivided into two types of lymphoma, which is the Hodgkin, I mean non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and then the other lymphomas. And each one of those, there's about 100 or 200 types. So there's wow. There's a lot of different types of lymphomas that mm-hmm. you can have, and it's just your immune system is compromised, and you know your lymph nodes uh, basically have cancer, and it can be many different symptoms, and many some can be very aggressive, some can be, you know, deadly, some can be manageable. Um, the particular time that type that I have is uh, non follicular lymphoma and um, non Hodgkin's follicular lymphoma, and it's a uh, disease that's, it was treatable but it's not curable as of right now. So the way it stands, and I will have to go treatment at some point. I'm in remission right now, and I'm not experiencing any symptoms, but I will have to go back into treatment. Um, When I found out about the the diagnosis, I went and saved heed. And, you know, at that point, the doctor was wanting to start treatment in Colombia. And... um, I was asking for a second opinion in the U.S., but it was challenging because no one wanted to really give me an opinion without traveling to the U.S. and going through all that stuff. I had also committed to safety in Vertical Blue, and I think that one was in June. I cannot remember, honestly. And uh, I think it was, yeah. I remember that. <clears throat> and I talked to the doctor and talked to him to letting me go safety, Vertical Blue, and, uh, and then come back for treatment. Um, when I went, when I was on the way to Vertical Blue, on the way back from Vertical Blue after safety, I was doing a quick stopover in the U.S. So I decided to send one last message to the doctor at UNC Hospital in Chapel Hill, and he replied to me directly and said, like, I, I'll basically just ask him, "Hey, this is what I have. Assuming that this is what I have, what is the type of treatment that you're going to do?" And his response was uh, more acceptable than the treatment that we're going to do in Colombia. Mm. In Colombia, it was a type of chemotherapy that was going to be more aggressive, and I, my hair would fall out, I would get more sick, and then the treatment that they were going to do in Chapel Hill was more manageable and would allow me to have a better quality of life during treatment, which was six months. Um, I started it in October, I believe, October, November, October, November and finished in March. Yeah. So that was process of also chemotherapy? Yeah, yeah, it was every month I would go in for two days and they would do infusions. Sometimes it would last like two, three hours, uh, sometimes four or five hours, sure, depending on the, because the, they do it in like two different drugs um, and depending on which drug it was and how quickly they could deliver it. Sometimes if they did it too fast, it would, it's actually painful, like your veins would hurt. Right, and yeah. so they have to back it down and the, the body would get used to it a little bit more so it could go a little faster the next time so i remember it was, it was between two and six hours uh two days out of the month basically every 28 days yeah. and the after you had the treatment did you also have a pretty tough time with like uh, physically or was it not too bad um is it was weird the the first treatment was really really challenging the first time they put the chemo in me like uh, it made me so nauseous. I started throwing up immediately um, there. And then after they like backed it down a little bit and had to do it a lot slower, um, I got home and it was fine. And then I think two days later, I started getting sick. So it was like, like if you, like you had the flu, like really bad, and just shivers and you know fever and <coughs> headaches and lack of energy for about two three days. No, I actually lasted for about a week. And um, then you started getting better. I made it, uh, like when, when I found out I had cancer, I just didn't want it to to control my life. So during chemo, I was adamant about maintaining some sort of physical shape. So as soon as I felt better, I would go to the gym. And that was my only option, really. I couldn't, um, couldn't get in the water. Mm-hmm. So swimming or diving was not an option for the six months mm-hmm. of chemo because of risk of infection. So the first one was really tough. Then two treatments later were okay then the last one was really tough as well and i started having some issues with uh, some markers that are important for your immune system um like uh my what's called uh gotta forget uh uh my neutrophil count was getting really low and then never heard of that 
Yeah, it's like uh, some combination of immune system cells that kind of tell how well your body is uh, to responding to infections and things like that. I think mm -hmm. it's some sort of white cell mixed with other counts, mm -hmm. and I might be getting this wrong. Uh, Juani, please don't kill me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but after that, like, uh, I had some issues with uh, my immune system. It was pretty low for probably about a year and a half, two years. And I had some lingering issues too with like swelling and some aches and pains in my knees and just weird things that I, that, you know, tried to ignore as best as I could, but sometimes it was challenging to do it. Um, the most important effect out of that was basically the, the low immune system, mm -hmm. which came to kick my ass yeah. when I went to safety uh, Rotan. Uh, world championships. All right, so you you basically recovered and you went through your chemotherapy. You went through the process, but um, you have to tell us about that experience. Like yeah, you know. so you know I've been working with Marco Constantino since 2013 when um, before he was chief of safety, and um, we just worked the safeties together in Vertical Blue, and then I had worked with him the previous year in Vertical Blue as well. And he asked me to help him out with safety in uh, Honduras and Rotan. Um, when I arrived, the, the team had been safety for a couple of weeks, and there was just a virus going around that was kind of kicking everybody's butt. And half of the team was sick and had a, you know, had a cold, couldn't dive. And then the other, team, the other half was fairly inexperienced, uh, just kind of getting their feet wet and learning the ropes for, the, you know, for safety. So it put like a... Uh, a big load workload for me for diving in addition to I got sick as well and my immune system was low and then I got a skin infection that started as a pimple and then it turned out into a crater that looked like the the eye sore on <laughs> <laughs> and um, it basically shocked my immune system so much that uh, I was in danger of going septic so I had to be med evac by private jet First time I flew in a private jet, nice. <laughs> and uh, into Fort Lauderdale, where I spent about uh, almost I think ten days or two weeks in the hospital trying to get me get the infection under control because mm -hmm. it was uh, it was starting to crawl into my veins and pop out in different places. Um, my veins were starting to get black in my leg, and it was pretty scary and, and really painful. Um, I can't remember the name of the the infection that I had, but it wasn't a staph infection. It mm -hmm. was. Uh, pseudonoma something or other and um yeah after that um basically that was 2019 uh 2020 is that when pandemic happened yeah yeah, yeah. About march <coughs> february march it started to really pick up yeah let me think let me get this timeline straight so i went to rotan that was uh, i think that's when i went to um Curacao as well yeah that's right so that same year <laughs> so many things happened uh that same year after that uh nope that wasn't it was it fuck i don't know <laughs> i have to like almost look but at a timeline at this point after the this really bad infection which is kind of like the result of a very compromised immune system yeah from your cancer and everything like that but at this point you're that was unfortunate, but you're in remission yes. already, and you have been since. Yes. So that's awesome. So I wish you continued you, health as long as uh, as long as you can. Whenever it uh, comes back, it. I'm gonna kick their ass again. Yeah, so. man, just fucking yeah, I'll do it again. It's okay. Take care of that <laughs> motherfucker. Excuse my language. <clears throat> um, so yeah, we're we're in pandemic time now. What what did you? How did you spend that pandemic time? Well, no, actually, that was not, I remember, yeah, that same year after that happened, I went to Bali to train, and then that's when I competed in Curaçao, and that was my, after Bali, I went to Curaçao, and that's when I, um, when I did my first competition with Walid in um, Ocean Quest. Mm. So that was... So that was during pandemic time? No, that was the year before pandemic. Right, okay. So okay. then I was, like, all excited, I was like, okay, so... You know, this competition went well enough for my first competition. I got a couple of national records and, you know, it's like I just felt like I didn't have the time, enough time to train because it was only three weeks. And as far as depth, I was so new to the sport and there's so much to learn. You think it's just going down, but it's, there's so many things involved yeah. in a successful dive. So you, you were 
after having all these years experience doing safety and stuff like that you were confident like what 30 40 meter kind of diver yeah 40 yeah, meters yeah. 40 i think 50 sometimes mm -hmm. like uh but never had the chance to go much right. deeper than that i think one time I, I did one dive and 55 meters but um yeah so i was super excited and then pandemic that's mm -hmm. when it happened i had like i was like okay i'm gonna take next year and take like three months and I was supposed to be the chief of safety for the free diving world series when that was going to get started for the Rotan stop and then uh you know pandemic started and everything just mm -hmm. kind of everybody had to change their life so much no yeah. competitions everything got canceled and so it's uh, the other false start um after cancer then um yeah that brings me to now i guess pretty much yeah so i first got wind of you excuse me, looking at the results from the uh, recent Free Diving World Cup in Sharm El Sheikh. Yeah. Um, and you were knocking out a couple of national records there again, do some pretty deep no fins, 70, 70 meters no fins. Yeah, the, the first one was 65 and uh, I had in mind before all this started, I wanted to get the continental record for South America, which was 70 and that was, uh, yeah, that was my better dive mm -hmm. out of the, uh, out of the yeah. ones in that competition. Yeah, yeah, and I saw you doing like a fairly easy 62 meters no fins, which I'm very admirable of. I'm hoping <laughs> I can get up there myself uh, one of these days. Um, yeah, you will. <coughs> and uh, you, uh, you had a couple of deeper dives as well, and free immersion as well, like you did. That. Yeah, and before coming to um, to here, I was in Bali for mm -hmm. a month, and um, that's when I started death training. Last year. Um, I went to Vertical Blue only as a guest. I didn't, I didn't compete. I didn't safety. I just watched, and um, I met. That's where I met Shaika, and then this year we started doing uh, base training in December, and then by April, beginning of April, we went to Bali for a month, and that's when I started the depth training. Um, yeah, I did a just an 80 meter uh, free immersion dive, and then came from there straight to here to do the charm competition, train for a couple of weeks, and get it in. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, now coming on to the, so now you're here, and it's nice to meet you and to dive with you and train with you. It's been awesome. Um, you dive in like 80 meters free immersion. I don't feel like I'm that far away myself from that. Um, uh, I think with a little bit of confidence and once my, once I'm a little bit more flexible. Um, but the really deep no fins, like, w what is it that, what do you, why, why do you think that, for me, a 40-meter no fins is so challenging, but an 80-meter free immersion is so easy, but for you, the, the, the dive disciplines are closer together and achievable depth, if you understand what I'm yeah. saying here? So for most people, you know, f no fins to me is swimming, like pure swimming. And I come from a swimming background, and I was a breaststroker, so that allows me to be more efficient in... Um, in swimming if you and i were or me and someone that never swam breaststroke and was trying to do a no fence dive went to a pool and we raced a 50 it would just be huge gap in between mm -hmm. those two fin uh, no fence requires a lot of technique and you know a lot of people just try to emulate what they see on on videos on youtube and sometimes the people that they're emulating are not necessarily have the best technique and it takes quite a bit of practice to develop that efficiency um, for me, right now, hypoxia is not the limit, it's equalization. So when I did the 80 meters free immersion, I was limited by my EQ. I don't feel like I've hit my hypoxic limit yet. I'm more in the, trying to work on relaxation and equalization. But I think, uh, yeah, it's just Alex. swimming. Hey, Alex. <laughs> Another Alex. Another Alex. <laughs> There's tons of them here. Um, yeah, I think swimming just gives me a, a big advantage in the in the no fins category. Mm -hmm. I feel like most people say you know no fins should be about seventy five percent or seventy percent of your you know your free immersion or your constant weight dives. And for me, up until this year, uh, no fins was my deepest mm -hmm. dive period. It was like sixty nine meters, and mm -hmm. my free immersion was sixty five or something mm -hmm. like that. So it mm -hmm. was like uh, it's just equalization. Uh, uh, hopefully, I can unlock that and yeah. continue with the progress. But uh, yeah, like you say, you've had a few false starts. So physically, you know, you're you're an athlete. You know, I can tell from having spent some time with you. But the equalization is not something that you can 
yeah. just get overnight. It's, it's, it's been tough lessons because, uh, you know, the, like all the other sports that I participated in, like, uh, you know, a threshold of pain is important. Yeah. You know, it's like an endurance. You're, you're in the, you go to the pain cave, man, and you mm -hmm. stay there sometimes. Mm -hmm. And uh, switching that mentality from listening to your body is something that's been a big adjustment for me. And and I'm probably not doing the best of job mm -hmm. uh, right now. Um, but at least I'm, I feel like I'm putting in the work and and kind of trying to go in that direction as well of just being more humble and taking more time and not putting so much pressure on myself to accomplish things or, or progress too quickly. Mm. You want to talk a little bit about the, the squeezing? Yeah, um, that's been one of the things that's been holding me back as well. Um, you know, from the people that I've talked to, which I've been fortunate to be surrounded by a lot of really, really, really good free divers, just about half of the hosts, and I mean, half of the guests in your podcast. Um, it's a matter of relaxation and experience. I just don't have the mileage for the deep diving. Mm -hmm. You know, it's been two months of... Uh, of depth for me and then other than that it was another two months four years ago and that's the extent of my experience and and depth and um just uh the lack of relaxation during my equalization is causing a little bit of squeezes and um it's something that i have to overcome maybe dial it back a little bit and and um you know start working again on on progressing the right way yeah yeah i mean i think it's also uh, you know, it's nice to be open about it, and it's something that I'm coming to realize more and more. You know, having, especially recently, <coughs> you know, the, the last episode that I released of the Free Diving Journal was the uh, the interview I did with uh, Andy about the the pulmonary edema study. Um, uh, I rec you know, in March I competed myself in my first competition and. I trained trained leading up to that competition, trained with some really, you know, some young guys getting deep and there's a lot of there's a lot of squeezing going on. And coming to Dahab, I've been here for a couple of weeks. Um people are squeezing left, right and center. Let's be honest about it. Yeah. And it's not uh you know, I remember probably four or five years ago I was probably in this mindset that, you know, like I would almost have said like squeezing is wrong. You know, there's, you should never squeeze. If you do things right, you should never squeeze. But it's it's absolutely not like that. It's um, it's a much more nuanced uh, situation, and we know there are things that we can do. There are more sensible ways to dive, but sometimes we are doing what we believe is sensible at that time, and still we might, um, you know, just we might just squeeze. Uh, and and like we mentioned like we were talking in dinner the other night there like there's such a whole spectrum of what a yeah. squeeze or an injury actually is whether it's symptomatic asymptomatic you know producing blood not producing blood where exactly it's located it's a very interesting topic but i think Quantity it's important blood, to, yeah yeah um, it's um <clears throat> it's for me like I, I get different information and we talked about this at dinner as well it's like a if you ask a free diver about squeezing 10 of them, you're going to get 10 different opinions. And mm -hmm. it's, it's, there's no hard science that I know of yet. And even some very smart people have contradictory opinions on the amount of rest or, you know, the, and so it's, it's challenging and it's something that I'm, you know, learning a lot more about and learning to have to be humble and, and do it properly. And I'm trying to, you know, take the steps to, to help it, you know, to mitigate the the dangers of squeezing. Yeah. Fortunately for me, it hasn't been like the big squeezes that I've seen before. It's just the uh, the small amount of blood and and the saliva, but it's something that I still would rather not deal with because I feel the effects the next day. Yeah. Feel a little tired and you know yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. For me, like <coughs> um, I I don't I've never felt anything in my chest. I don't ever feel like I've um, had any injury like down in my lungs but um a few times i've i've squeezed like way way up in my i, I don't even like to call it trachea i think it's i think it's probably more sensible to call it like larynx or something like that but um so the way that i'm approaching my diving now is like i think maybe it's similar to you it's like physically we can go down there right but it's like you know we can go down we can come back up but it's how we go down and how we come back up and the the, the level of relaxation and awareness and looseness and softness that you can have and uh, i think like what you're saying it's like you look at someone like guillaume neri or alexi or william like they've got like 10 15 yeah. years of of this uh, process and this time in the water and 
and those guys like now we are we have all this information it's so easy for us to go so deeply so quickly with mouthfeel and things like exactly. that exactly you know those guys were like figuring it out and taking it like meter by meter, meter yeah. by meter like Guillaume that's what Guillaume said you know like they would he would like go two meters and then he would stay there for like 10 dives and then two meters and then stay there and yeah we're not doing that uh, sometimes you know it's uh it's so easy when you are you're you're feeling great to yeah it's it's weird too because uh, we also talked about um you know the different conditions on a given day can help or, or aid getting a squeeze or not getting a squeeze and some of those we just don't have any clue what they are yeah. and you know equalization has been a burden for me when even in that training cycle um uh, years back in 2019 and i did some pretty silly dives for me where there was a lot more tension than i'm doing now because i'm actually getting a little better equalization and never squeezed and then uh, i've never had a squeeze in my life until i came to egypt and the depths you know my pb before egypt was 69 meters no fins 70 meters is just one meter more yeah. and then yeah. i haven't really done that much more depth um past that in this cycle and i'm you know i'm having issues with it so I don't know what factor is leading to that cost and it's you know such a great science and I don't think that anyone could pinpoint it either. Yeah. So many contributing factors and all of them we don't really know yeah. about. I mean you can make a guess at uh, hydration, you can make a guess at like uh, <coughs> mineral content in your body at one particular time, you make a, make a guess on like uh, hormones might be involved, uh, neurotransmitters might be involved, genetics might be involved. So many different, but maybe this um, this uh, poop bacteria getting yeah. into your lungs somehow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, the desert here, man. The air is like it yeah. sucks the moisture out of you yeah. so quickly. Yeah, like yesterday, like I had to have that tea before I dive because I felt like, you know, I'm 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 often producing a little bit of like sputum in the mornings anyway because I you know I smoke for 20 years heavily. I, my lungs are always a little bit uh, dodgy, but. Um, yeah, like I just felt like it was, nothing was moving in there. Um, I feel much better today though, but uh, it's it's challenging the air yeah. here, challenging the hydration, staying hydrated. Like you were saying yesterday, it's like you just keep drinking, 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 but you still feel dry. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. But um, yeah, so we've discussed uh, your background, discussed the heavy stuff, <laughs> um, um, discussed the challenges that you're having now with your diving, but also the successes, you know, like you're basically only getting started. Um, yeah. Uh, I think you're a bit of a specimen. I think you're a bit of an athlete. I oh, think what? You, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think you, uh, you're you going to be interesting to watch um, over the coming years. Um, looking forward to it. Um, tell us a little bit about like how you approach your training. Uh, like How structured is it? I know you have, you're have you getting some coaching. So like, what phase are you in right now? Who's coaching you? And what, what are you aiming for? What, what's the next competition that you're going to take part in? Yeah, so I've been coached before in previous sports, and uh, I recognize it's important having some help. Um, Vito Mir has been helping me out with uh, with some coaching, and uh, Vito Mir Maricic. yes, the one and only. Yeah. And um, you know, we started first with the base training, and he's also helping Shaika with some coaching, and then um, from there we moved on to depth. It's been uh, a little bit um, not as uh, a strict lately because uh, he's tied up quite a bit with uh, world championships and pool and a lot of stuff going on so right now I'm kind of leaning on guys like Stefan and you and, and other knowledge to sort of make progress and uh, in equalization and same thing with uh, you know taking workshops with Tito uh, Sapala for equalization and just kind of trying to absorb as much as I can at this point and and just try to get better with the EQ um, once I leave here, which will be tomorrow, I'll go to Bahamas and Vitomir will be there. So hopefully we'll resume a more strict uh, uh, coaching program for depth. Um, I will leave Bahamas about halfway through Vertical Blue. Shaika is competing there and, um, and I'll go to World Championships in Rotan, which will be my first competition after uh, uh, World, um, the World Cup in Charm. And then uh, after that, we'll go to Turkey for SEMAS. I'm lucky enough to have two passports. So <laughs> I'm competing, I'm doing my competitions for ADA uh, for Colombia 
and then uh, we'll go represent uh, Team USA and um, for CMOS World Championships. That's not fair, man. It's not, but remember, I was uh, passportless for about 20 years, right, okay. so I'm making up for it now. Right, okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is Vitomir uh, competing this time in Vertical Blue? I believe he is. Um, I think so. I know he did not compete in the World Championships uh, for Ada Pool, but he did in the CMOS. Um, mm -hmm. Not sure, honestly. Haven't had as much contact as I typically do with him because he's been so busy yeah. um, in this past few weeks. It's okay. I understand why you're not answering my emails or my messages, <laughs> Vitomir. No problem. Wait until after this uh, World Championship. I think is he needs up. like a week long nap and then he might answer your emails. Um, <clears throat> yeah, cool. So, um, but yeah, anyways, uh, you know, this is. What I want to say is uh, coaching is, to me, is super helpful when you, if you have goals and you want to, you know, progress the right way, you know, we can try to figure some things out ourselves and, you know, tinker a little bit. But for me, it always helps to have someone to tell me what to do. Otherwise, then I'm more likely to get in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. And for me, it's also like a big step up now, just coming here and like, uh, fortunately, I've sort of fallen nicely in with some nice people like Stefan has been amazing yeah uh, thanks for the ride Stefan and yeah Stefan just, is the man yeah it's just you, you you come on to a new level here just with the people that you're surrounded by and just the information that you can share back and forth when we're sitting after dives or whatever or even in the water and there's a, a different kind of uh, ambience for, from what I've been used to in my training I've always felt like so alone in what I'm doing but here it's a very supportive environment and then I guess like formalized coaching and following that structure is like the next level and um, it's interesting because you know the the evolution of this podcast and the, the way that we talk about training is like I used to ask people like what their like what their complementary training was like you know Alessia did like rollerblading and like this person does like mountain biking mm -hmm. and and what's happening now is you see that the more and more people that you talk to the more and more of them tend to be following a coach getting coaching from whether it's like Vito Me or Julia or yes. whatever it is and the, the, so like there's a convergence happening in the style and the approach towards free diving training over time and it's professionalizing a lot more right absolutely if you know back in the day I felt like uh, when people talked about training for free diving they just meant doing depth and uh, I like this more complete approach where there's you know strength component to it uh, cross training there's uh, Actually, you want to be in good physical shape. There's not just stretching and free diving, which is what people thought would get you there. And uh, to me, it makes the journey a little bit more enjoyable and more diverse. And you know, yeah, yeah. yeah and I was working out <coughs> with you the other day, and you were doing <laughs> weight weighted pull ups and muscle ups, uh, like bar muscle ups, and and you were saying like these like th this was programmed by Vitomir as well, right? These uh, pull -ups, yeah. At yeah. first, he did a he did a really nice strength program. I've never been a very strong person. As you could tell by my squats. <laughs> <laughs> squats were ridiculous. Everything else very impressive. <laughs> yeah, I think I was squatting an empty bar and you were holding the holding it for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not one to talk. I have, I have. No, you post, get thunder thighs, I, I, man. I, well, yeah, but I ha also had to post the, uh, losing the losing the plates from the bar as well. I had to post that. If you want to see some funny shit, check out Free Dive and Thrive uh, on Instagram. I will post all my fails there. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I was a uh, cameraman on that one. Yeah, <laughs> it was good work. Um, <clears throat> yeah, but like this um, complementary strength training where, you know, people are actually trying to get like pretty damn strong for yeah. free diving is, is becoming much more kind of uh, accepted as like, yeah, I mean, like um, there's more than one way to skin a cat, you know, to get to depth. But exactly. uh, being strong is also important, right? Yeah, I think there's several components that were ignored in the past that are, you know, a lot of people are succeeding because they've incorporated it into their training. Um, the people that are at the top, the, the people that are at the top of the sport right now, um, they train really hard and they mm -hmm. don't just do laps in the pool and they don't just, uh, you know, do depth. They're, you know, cross training and focusing on other things as well to complement their performances. Yeah. Yeah, let's, um, I think Stefan is a, a perfect example of like, you can see somebody who's just like absolutely in the zone of following his program, following his training, and he's completely zen-like and like integrated into that. And yeah, you know, I, I hope that I can get to that 
point uh, it's, sometime. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, I was talking to Stefan about that because uh, being coach uh, sometimes can be, I don't want to say, I don't know if frustrating is the right word, but uh, you saw Stefan dive and you know what he's capable of. And the coach is not holding him back because that's not the right thing, but just making his progress be very incremental. And you know Stefan can go down and do a 70-meter no-fence dive mm -hmm. today if he wanted to, mm -hmm. but coach doesn't want him to get there, and there's a reason behind it, you yeah. know, in, in structuring the program. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's very nice to have someone to kind of control your impulses and, and structure it so that you can progress in the right way. Hopefully, I'll get there as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. very impressed by Stefan and his yeah, training yeah. as well. Yeah, we'll catch up with Stefan on, uh, on one of the videos that we're going to do uh, um, maybe next week before he leaves for uh, VB. Um, yeah, so just to sort of like uh, take us um, towards the Desert Island questions now, you were doing some work for a movie. Just tell us a little bit about that. Like, are we going to uh, yeah. get to see you in like a big blockbuster movie? Yeah, uh, hopefully by the time this podcast comes out, if you uh, if you get it out in time, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, in November I'll be in a in a Marvel movie. I honestly have no idea if my face will be shown. I was doing some uh, background underwater stuff because it's going to be a pretty heavy underwater scenes, and um, that was another one of the the best false starts I had was actually last year. That's why I didn't get started last year is because I got the um, opportunity to work in, on this Marvel movie for about eight months mm -hmm. and I just could not give it up. Mm -hmm. Are you allowed to mention the name of the movie? No. No, okay. I mean, maybe we can talk about it later. I'm going to cover, put my hand here just in case the video is picking it up. Let's just say there's uh involves a kitty. It's kind of like a, like the cat that's uh, black, but it's a lot bigger. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because I thought they weren't going to make that one. No, yeah. I'm thinking, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is, well, that's is said the enough. one that you're thinking. Yeah, yeah. Said enough. yeah. <laughs> said enough. Well, that's awesome, man. So you you got a chance to just watch that wire there, buddy. Yeah. yeah. I'm getting to do Joe Rogan shit now. Yeah. <laughs> Come close um, to the mic. <laughs> um. Uh, that was eight months and a nice job. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. Great experience. Got to work with some incredible people. Some uh, PFI instructors were there as well. Um, the free diving community was well represented, and uh, I think the movie. As far as the underwater scenes and the stuff that they wanted to get out of us, uh, came, it's going to come out really good. I hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing. I might actually watch a Marvel movie for a change <laughs> if uh, if I can see you jumping around in the background somewhere. Yeah, you're going to love the costumes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not guaranteeing that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's it's hard for me to watch those movies, man. They're usually like bore me to tears. Um, yeah, I can see why. Yeah. So um, let's move into these desert island questions then. Um, okay. <coughs> sorry if you're not a Patreon supporter. you got to get out now. Uh, if you are, then hi. I promise I will become around. one. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to let you hear your own answers <laughs> if you don't. <coughs> um, all right. So what would be your perfect morning routine? This section of the show, the Desert Island Questions, is part of the extended version of the show I put out for Patreon supporters. If you would like to say thanks for the work I do on this project, if you would like to show some love and help me out a little bit on my own freediving journey, then please consider supporting the show through Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash freedivecafe to find out more. I'll put a link in the video description below. Which people have been most influential in your life? Like, who would you like to give a shout out to? Um, you mentioned your dad there. You yeah, you my like dad would be first and foremost. Uh, without him, I wouldn't be the person that I am. And, you know, we had our challenges and, and everything, but he made me who I am. He introduced me to all these sports. He gave me, like, this sense of adventure and searching. And always, like, when I wanted to become an engineer, he was always tell me like you do not want to do that like I did it this is not for you and of course like you know you try your best not to become your dad and then they end up having such an impact in you that you end up becoming a lot like them um, from a free diving standpoint I've been so fortunate to meet so many people that have influenced me and helped me out and it's great about this community everybody seems to be so willing to offer help and encouragement and um you know, people like recently uh, Tito Sapala, Stefan Randig, 
before then, there was Martin Stepanik was my first mentor and the person who introduced me to free diving. Um, you know, William Trubridge is an inspiration from his accomplishments. Alexei, um, Alessia is a dear friend and such a sweet person. Man, there's so many amazing free divers and athletes that have inspired me in one way or another. Um, one that I actually particularly to give a shout out to is uh, is Jonathan Sonnex and obviously he was he's a great free diver and a great friend but he might have been uh one of the catalysts for me to to give the middle finger to my job and um and just uh, pursue a different lifestyle so it was a big influence in me nice. thank you johnny well done for wrecking his life johnny yeah <laughs> <laughs> um so just uh like what do you like you, any long-term plans or dreams like you know beyond the world <coughs> championships like anything you want to do you want to like get a boat or buy a house or whatever. no man the to me this is the dream like uh to continue pursuing my passions uh to not give in to the status quo of uh you know what i left behind of working and accumulating properties and just i mean accumulating um, possessions and just keep traveling and meeting interesting people and doing the things that i love and yeah that's this is my dream i'm, I'm living it i'm fortunate so we're living the dream yes uh, how can people find you on social media what are your uh, wh where are you at I am doing my social media better so much. yeah <laughs> it's uh, I'm trying my best to to put effort <clears throat> into social media It's uh, at salty free diver on Instagram or Alex Ginas on Facebook um, it's not that great but it's getting better uh, mm -hmm. some people are helping me uh, encouraging me to post more it's a little uncomfortable for me but uh yeah. if you can help me with a few follows i'm sure that helps in one yeah. way or another <laughs> yeah i can feel you man like that uh alex at uh, poi the other uh, alex um too uh, many of them too many <laughs> of them so one of them he was saying like yeah i want to send him this video that i took today he's like i'm not on any social media i was so jealous it's like okay <sighs> so you have an email address and that's it <laughs> boom fantastic yeah tito's not on uh, instagram Is that either right? yeah. yeah huh huh how do people find him then I don't really know. Yeah, or? reputation from working yeah. uh, with Andrea Zuccari mm -hmm. and he's yeah. Italian, right? Does yeah. he get mostly Italian students? No, and customers? I think uh, you know he developed a good reputation working in Charm with uh, with Andrea for a long time, and people just know who he is in this community. And you know, if you ask anyone here about equalization in Dahab, they're probably going to send you to Tito. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Now, just to finish up, um, can you just say in a few words? why you free dive because i love it all right thanks brother danny thank you very awesome much man. Pleasure. i appreciate the opportunity man you've been a great friend over here man it's yeah, been man. awesome hanging it's out with to you meet you you've welcomed me here i you know i had someone to uh to hang with and just train with from the beginning so thanks so much and uh thanks to you guys too dive safe thank you dive safe all right boom boom that was Alex Ginas, great guy, great diver, and I'm very much looking forward to meeting him in the water again. In the meantime, please hit the subscribe button, notification, ding ding, you know what to do to stay up to date with this channel. This podcast lives at www.freedivecafe.com. Everything I do, including the podcasts, the videos, and free diving courses and coaching and education and entertainment of all sorts can be found at freediveandthrive.com. Please consider becoming a patron and getting access to extended episodes and exclusive content and discounts on courses and coaching. If you want to learn free diving, you can do that with me in Taiwan this year. Uh, I hear the borders are just about to open up maybe in a couple of weeks, mid-October. Um, and October to December is an amazing time to learn free diving in Taiwan. After that, I should be in Dahab uh, if everything goes to plan. And you can come and learn free diving from me in Dahab in 2023. My Instagram is Freedive and Thrive. And Freedive underscore Taiwan is the one for my school here in Taiwan. All right. Until we meet again, dive safe. <laughs>